Hi, this is Dr. McCola, and today we're here with Dr. Paul Conard, who is our honored guest and really is a, the, one of the true experts in the movement to oppose fluoridation. He's trained as a chemist and his specialty is environmental chemistry, and he's really known throughout the world as a leader in this movement because of his knowledge base. And he is full time dedicated to this. He's a, a head of an organization called the Fluoride Action Network, or FAN.net, I believe, mm -hmm. FAN.net. Yeah. It really has compiled amazing information. But we're, our purpose of our meeting today in our interview is to really give you some information that you may have not be, been aware of before and then to actually provide some take-home points that we can start to implement the process to remove fluoride from the water supply of the United States. Because the United States is only one of eight countries in the entire world, the entire developed world, that has more than 50% of their water supply fluoridated, if you can believe that. Most all of Europe is not fluoridated. Yeah, only if uh, just Ireland is fluoridated. Ireland. Over uh, 50, uh, Ireland is the only country in Europe with over 50% of it or fluoridated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Spain has a little bit of fluoridation. England is at 10%. It's been at 10% for years. So, yeah. Most of mainland Europe is not fluoridated, and yet their teeth are just as good, if not better, than ours. Yeah, so that's the challenge here. We have the United States, supposedly, you know, the, one of the wisest scientific countries in the world, but yet we're still engaging this process, which is questionable at best. As you'll, I'm sure you'll reach that conclusion. So uh, that is really the, the sort of the central core. But we're hoping to get people interested and uh, committed to action efforts in 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 three areas primarily. One is Canada because only 40% of Canada is fluoridated and we believe with some effort, some strong effort, we have a lot of people viewing this who are who live in Canada, that we can actually get Florida out of the entire country of Canada. And I think that's doable in the near future. Yeah, British Columbia and uh, Quebec are essentially non-fluoridated now. So it's really most of the fluoridation is concentrated in Alberta and Ontario. And if Ontario goes, Canada goes. Yeah, so that's a doable thing. And then the other two communities in the United States that we want to focus our efforts on because we've always, we've already have a leaders, leadership in this area and, and some of the media support, which is key to getting it removed from the community, is uh, San Diego, California, and Austin, Texas. Now, there may be some other communities that we're not aware of, and the purpose of this format in Vital Votes, you'll know below the comment here, there's an opportunity for you to participate. And if you're already registered, it's fine. You can just add your comment. If not, it's just a simple process to add it. And then let us know that you're interested in starting a movement in your local community and we can work together to collect that information and, and start the process rolling. But those are the three areas we're going to focus on. So if you, you, know, if you already know about fluoride, most likely you're going to learn more because this is the world expert sitting next to me. And this, I'm just so delighted we we're, 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 uh, we're, have the opportunity to work with you because we, we get together regularly with our team mm -hmm. once a quarter and one of our highest priorities is to remove fluoride from the water supply. Yeah. So we're absolutely committed. We're working with him. Uh, Paul to do this and, and it's an achievable goal. I really think we can yeah. do it. It's as easy to stop as turning off a tap. You know, yeah. right now we have this huge problem in the Gulf of Mexico trying to tap a, a, a leaking oil well. I mean, everybody knows that. It's incredibly difficult. But fluoridation, if we had the political will, it's as easy to stop tomorrow as just turning off a tap. Yes, and, and you know, the, the, the supposition, the theory as to why it was initially introduced seems beneficial. I mean, it's yeah. a public health benefit. Who would be, you'd have to be out of your mind to oppose reducing dental caries in kids. That's right. Harmlessness and children. Yeah. I mean, yeah. who could be opposed to that? Certainly we aren't, yeah. but the issue is let's, in, uh, let's provide an intervention that's actually going to achieve that yeah. rather than, than support one that is not achieving that, but even worse, Causing harm That's and right. damage. That's all right. So exactly. why don't you why don't you expand on that concept? Well, there are many arguments against fluoridation. Of course, number one, it's very bad medicine because once you put it in the water, you can't control the dose. You can't control who gets it. No one's there's no oversight. You're allowing a, a community to do to everyone what a doctor can do to to no one. Force them to take medication. Secondly, it's it's. Um, it's avoidable, it's unnecessary, because they now, even the promoters of fluoridation, concede that the major benefits are topical. It works from the outside of the tooth, not from inside of the body. So why swallow it? Why put it in the drinking water when you can brush your teeth with fluoridated toothpaste? And it's ineffective 
There is practically no difference in tooth decay between fluoridated countries, which is the majority, and non-fluoridated countries. No difference between fluoridated states or, or states which have a high percentage of fluoridation and, and those which have because, low. Because it's an important tangent. There's a large number of communities within the United States currently yeah. that do not fluoridate their water. Is that yeah. correct? No, the, the majority fluoridate. The majority do, but there's a large number. Yeah, there's a large the number that don't, and you right. can't tell the difference. If right. you look at them, you can't tell the difference between the communities of fluoridated and non-fluoridated. Um, and then, at the, as you've said, in addition to all of that, it's probably causing harm. We know that 32% of American children have been overexposed to fluoride because you have this telltale sign of dental fluorosis, which in its mildest form, little white specks, but when it gets more serious, it, the, the, it affects more of the surface of the teeth and it becomes colored, yellow, brown, orange, and, and so on, mottling of, of the teeth. 32% of American children are overexposed to fluoride. Well, their attitude, the promoters of fluoridation, say, well, oh, it's just a cosmetic effect. It's a, uh, a small price to pay for yeah. reducing your dental care. Exactly. Right. But uh, as we said, it, it is not reducing dental care by, by very much, if any. And at the same time, this is an indicator for somebody who's studied toxicology, environmental chemistry, as I've done. This is a, a worrying indicator that the body has been overexposed to fluoride. And it will be a biochemical miracle if fluoride that's damaging the growing tooth cells is not damaging something else in the child's body. For example, the, the bones. The teeth are the, the window to the bones. Have you seen the, you're seeing the damage to the teeth. What damage can you not see? Especially to, 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 to growing developmental child. Absolutely. 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 And now we have 23 studies, if you believe, from four different countries. Uh, Brazil, um, Iran, India, and China, which indicate that moderate exposure to fluoride is lowering IQ in children. And the levels, are the, the lowest level that they estimate that this is happening, 1.9 parts per million fluoride. Well, if you've got an effect, 1.9 parts per million with a few hundred children in the study, and I visited the villages in China where that study was done, I, I, there's not enough margin of safety to protect every child that's being exposed to fluoride. You need a much larger margin of safety than that. And this, this, uh, this study here, this, um, this is the National Research Council. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, asked the National Research Council to do this study. It took them over two, two years to do, 507 pages. And, and what's the National Research Council for those who aren't familiar it's, with it's it? A, it's part of the National Academies. Uh, National Academies, yeah, and, and and that's a private or is it a is it is it a court is it a government? It's institution? a private entity, but the government uses it a lot for for when they want a study with an it's independent a, independent objective. Ad, exactly, okay. and this was one of the most balanced panels that's ever looked. So you're at you're Florida. convinced that there was really no significant. Uh, members on the committee that have serious conflicts of interest as do so many of these other expert panels. No, in fact, it was the first time they ever had people on there that were publicly anti-fluoridation and people on there that were pro-fluoridation. Usually, it's usually they're all pro-fluoridation mm -hmm. uh, because it's an establishment uh, position. Mm -hmm. But um, no, they looked at it for two or three years and came back and said that the, the current uh, safe drinking water standard in the EPA is too high and it should be lowered. Uh, and after four years, the EPA has done, done nothing, practically no, published nothing. Yeah, so that's an interesting aspect. I mean, the government asked for a study objective, done, it was done and performed and showed that it, it real, the policy needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. and, and over four years later, nothing has happened. No, no, nothing has happened. So this is based on the government's own data. So and, and, and look at it. Basically, what you've got is you, you've got the CDC saying one part per million is good for children to drink to protect their teeth. And we have now the National Research Council saying that the safety standard of four parts per million is too high and needs to be lowered. Again, what margin of safety would you want to protect the whole population? Well, I like to look at it from a different perspective too because it's important to understand that adding fluoride to the water supply is really, it, it is a drug. It is it, absolutely, it's a drug. There's no question. You can't try to get fluoride without a prescription. You can't do it. No. It's a drug. But this is the only example of a drug 
that is put into the water supply on a mandatory basis where a person has no choice about it, just being exposed to that. There is no other example of this. It doesn't exist. No. I mean, this is essentially, it's, you're lo it's, a, it's in a major assault on your freedom of choice. That's right. I mean, I'd love to go to, to the tap and, and pour out a glass of water and, and drink it. And it <laughs> you know what the irony here is? That the FDA, which doesn't regulate fluoride in drinking water at all, the FDA does regulate toothpaste. Mm -hmm. And on the back of a tube of toothpaste, and your viewers can, can watch this and look at it, read the, on the back and of a tube of toothpaste. Almost any commercial, obviously there's toothpaste at health food stores that, yeah. that are non-fluoride. But the fluoridated toothpaste, if it's fluoridated on the back, FDA required, uh, do no, if your child swallows more than the recommended amount, contact a poison, poison center. control center, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, the amount that they're talking about, the recommended amount, which is a pea-sized amount, is equivalent to one glass of water. But no one, the FDA is not putting a label on the tap saying, don't drink more than one glass of water, or if you do, contact a poison center. So you've got this Tweedledum and Tweedledee. How much fluoride is there in a typical size of toothpaste? How much, is there enough to kill one child, two children? If, child? if a child, a child, a child would probably be sick, vomit long before they got through a whole tube of toothpaste. But th there's, there's no question that fluoride in, in a, 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 not an excessive amount can cause serious harm. Uh, there have been examples of children who've swallowed the gel mm -hmm. that is used for topical treatment, and they've died a, as a consequence. So fluoride is, is extreme. It, it, it's a poison, folks. It's it can poison. kill you. Yeah. And they're putting this in your toothpaste. I mean, yeah. it's just... It's just almost incomprehensible. So th the thought when you're using a toothpaste yeah. that, it's just, just that it is a topical, and, and you know, we're going to give them that. Say it may work topical, and it may. Yeah. We, there's not really definitive proof that yeah. it may, but it may. It clearly does not work systemically, yeah. and that's what there's warning on this. So the challenge when you, wash, when, you, when you brush your teeth is that it just doesn't stay in your teeth. There's a tendency to swallow yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. And that's, that's the problem. That's the problem. And we know that there's, as far as this dental ferocious is concerned, for example, uh, st scientists have shown that there's a greater risk of dental ferocious if your kid brushes his teeth twice a day compared to one that drinks it or uh, uses it once a day. But going back, we're not talking about killing people outright mm -hmm. with drinking water. What we're concerned I mean, about a, a, is the chronic. Right. This is a, an example of, of that this is, can kill you. I'm not saying mm -hmm. it, it typically doesn't. It's but, poisonous. But it's a poison. Yeah. And, and what we're really concerned about, for example, if you take the bones, 50% yeah. of all the fluoride that you take in each day essentially accumulates in your bones over a lifetime. And it takes, what, about half-life turnover of bones? maybe three times in a lifetime. So you're steadily increasing the fluoride levels in your bones. And what we know from India and China, where they have areas with high natural fluoride levels, is that the first symptoms of fluoride poisoning the bone is just like arthritis, pains in the joints and so on. And yet there's never been a study in the United States to see if there's an association between p people living in fluoridated areas and increasing arthritis Rates. I've got two, two points there. Now, I think we mentioned, you mentioned earlier that China and Japan both are non-fluoridated as countries. Is that oh, correct? Oh, that's right. Yes. No. So the entire country, the largest country on the planet, China, and then Japan, a very sophisticated, technological country, both are not fluoridated. Now, uh, there's, uh, the other question I had on this, uh, or point I wanted you to comment on, was the distinction between naturally occurring fluoride, the one that you yeah. mentioned in China and India, and the type of fluoride that is added Yes. to the t traditional fluoride treatments in this country through, tooth yes. through the toothpaste or the water supply, the two most common yeah. sources. So I wonder if you can comment on that. Yeah, the 90% the of the chemicals used in fluoridation in the United States are not natural. It's, it's a substance called hexafluorosilicic acid or, mm -hmm. or, uh, or it's sodium salt. We'll say silicon fluorides. Mm -hmm. And these silicon fluorides are captured pollutants from the phosphate fertilizer industry. Mm -hmm. in the, when you're making phosphate fertilizers, you take phosphate rock, heat it up with sulfuric acid to drive off the phosphoric acid to make the soluble phosphate. In the process, it generates two very toxic gases, hydrogen fluoride and silicon tetrafluoride. And for about 100 years, these decimated the local area, the vegetation, crippled cattle, and so on. And eventually, they were required to capture these toxic gases. And they used a spray of water. And that spray of water can, uh, produces these silicon fluorides. <clears throat> that stuff 
The scrubbing liquor cannot be dumped into the sea by international law. It can't be dumped locally because it's too darn concentrated. But if someone buys it, <laughs> it's no longer a hazardous waste. It's a product. And there's no, then there's none of the regulations which control. And, and where, who buys it? The public water utilities buy this stuff and put it in our drinking water. It's absolutely absurd. You know, as Bill Hersey from the EPA points out, if, if, you, if it goes into the air, it's a pollution. If it goes into the local water, it's, it's pollution. But if, if the public water utilities buy it, it's, it's no longer a pollutant. It, it, it's bizarre. So not only are we doing something quite unique, using the public water supply to deliver medicine, as you said, it's never been done, apart from one short experiment with iodine, didn't work, never been done to do that. And secondly, we're using the public water supply to get rid of hazardous waste from the phosphate industry. It makes a lot of money for them, but of course it would cost them a lot of money to get rid of it as hazardous waste. Yeah, so <coughs> one of the things that we see in the news is the use of fluoride uh, supplement to the water supply, municipal water supplies, mm -hmm. from China. Now, yes. and, and I'd like you to comment on this, but it, 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 it's somewhat confusing to me because it seems like there would be a surplus of this toxic material in the United States alone. Yeah. It's just China able to sell it to them less expensively? Yeah. It's, uh, so, it's, so, so China's coming to the market now. Well, it's two, thi two things are going on. Number one, the number of companies that were making phosphate down in Florida has reduced. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there have been some problems down there, with, uh, <clears throat> and so on. And also, China has a large supply of this stuff, and uh, they're able to sell because they're it Because they're, they're a manufacturer, and they're producing these raw but th these <coughs> materials. Yeah. And it's a by toxic byproduct of yeah, their, their industrial uh, process, and they want to sell it too, and they could sell it cheaper. And one of the peculiar things that's happening is that some communities in the United States, including a town in Massachusetts, I forgot the name, have stopped using this because they were, it was producing a sludge. It was jamming up the delivery system. It was a white sludge. And, you know, the Center of Disease Control engineers said, we don't know what this sludge is, but we know it's safe. Well, if you don't know what it is, Joe, how can you say it's safe? But this well, we is can't. And actually, in our discussion earlier, we are going to seek to obtain a so source of some of this Good. fluoride from, from China and actually have it analyzed by that, some that objective independent laboratories and see what's in this uh, that is actually being introduced into the water supply of so many lo uh, local American communities. But I'm glad you've used the word natural because they, they do that a lot. They say, oh, well, fluoride is just natural. It's, it's in the water naturally. Well, you know, the, the natural levels are about 10 times, on the main, on average, 10 times less than we, we add to the water. And the, and the current levels in the water is one part per what, million? The, the level that they use for fluoridation ranges from 0.7 to 1.2, depending upon the, the weather, the climate. But the word, the na when we're talking about natural, I think the key natural thing to look at is the level in mother's milk, mm -hmm. baby's first meal, right? That level is up to 250 times less than they add to the water. We add as a, about one part per million. The level in mother's milk ranges from 0 0.04 to 0 0.004 parts per million. So a bottle-fed baby can get up to 250 times more fluoride than nature intended for the newborn baby or for a breastfed baby. And there's a lot of reasons why infants shouldn't be receiving infant formula. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, breast milk obviously is the way to go, and there's other alternatives mm -hmm. to that. But this clearly is, is a significant issue. And I'm wondering um, if you know of any known benefit for fluoride? It's in breast milk. Is it, is it in there because it's required by the infant or is it in there because it's, it's a, a contaminant in the, in well, the it's, environment? It, it's out there. So the fluoride is, fluorine is about the 13th most abundant element in, in, the, in, the, universe, in the, on the planet, on the Earth's crust. Yeah, because in, in aluminum we know, yeah. it, which is even more abundant, yeah. there's no, 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 no medical or health purpose. So it's a contaminant, it's a toxic poison, you want to avoid it. Is that similar to fluoride? I th yes, it, it's very, very low in mother's milk, and, and the suggestion is that it, and there's been no evidence, no evidence, no scientific evidence has ever been brought forth to show that fluoride is an essential nutrient, none. To demonstrate that something is an essential nutrient, you have to starve the animal of this source, mm -hmm. and if it's a nutrient, then they develop a disease. Mm -hmm. There's no disease that develops with a shortage of fluoride which is, as you, as you would imagine, is just as well if it's so low in, in mother's milk. As far as tooth decay is concerned, 
This tooth decay is not caused by lack of fluoride. Tooth decay is caused by um, acids in the mouth, usually created from the uh, sugar being metabolized back by bacteria, Streptococcus mutans, and it's the acid that then attacks the enamel. And if it, if it attacks it enough, then the, the bacteria can get into the dentine and you get tooth decay. Yeah. So it's, it's not a, a disease caused by a lack of fluoride. It's a lack of dental care, particularly relevant in poor communities with poor access to dentists. And a lack of information and uh, discernment to, to, to really cut through the me media manipulation and the nonsense because the number one source of calories in the United States is high fructose corn syrup. Right. And when you have that sugar as your number one source of calories, right. you're going to shift the terrain, the biological uh, levels of different bacteria in your system mm -hmm. and you're going to produce the bad bacteria versus the good bacteria. So this yeah. shift that shifts, you get the, the and, this, and these bacteria will produce these acids. Because if you mm -hmm. go to primitive cultures where they are avoiding sugar, you just do not see Absolutely. dental cares. And even whole countries where they tend to have very low sugar, like Korea. Yeah. I mean, you try to find a cavity in a, in a uh, yeah. native Korean, they're just not there. It's like 1% yeah. of the population has cavities. You're absolutely right. We need education not fluoridation. Yeah. And that education would have a double dividend of, of avoiding the high fructose sugar would not only be a, score a huge benefit with dental decay, but also with obesity. And health. Uh, yes. And oh, the the, the right? I mean, we have a huge problem here. When you've got teenagers getting diabetes, type 2 diabetes, you think of the cost that's going to be. So fluoridation, if we had the political will, is as easy to stop as turning off a tap and we could have this double dividend if we use the, se the money that we are squandering on chemicals and equipment to deliver this stuff and all the tanker trucks which are going around the country and all the money that's spent on propaganda, on promotion by the government, by the Dental Association, American Dental Association, so if we took that money and put it into education to avoid what you talked about, high fructose syrup and so on. And just optimizing your diet. And better dental care. I mean, brush your teeth after meals, all those things, floss your teeth and so well, on. Well, that's important, but really, when you go to these countries who are eating right to begin that's with, right. they don't do those practices. <laughs> it's really an artifact that needs to be implemented when you're choosing unhealthy lifestyles. You know, it's funny, there's an irony here. In the 1930s, <clears throat> Weston Price, who was a former president of the American Dental Association, which pushes, pushes, pushes fluoridation, wrote a book mm -hmm. and established just what you said, that indigenous peoples around the world, from the Inuits to the Aborigines to the Maoris and so on, had perfect teeth until Western diets, refined sugar and all those other things. And it's, it's actually, from my understanding of his life work, around the turn of the 19th century, from 1900 to 2000, mm -hmm. is when he was a practicing mm -hmm. dentist. Mm -hmm. And he saw this enormous increase in dental decay. That, yeah. and, and he made the correlation. It was actually due to the introduction of processed foods. Yeah, yeah. In the 30s. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and then he went around the world to document this and yep. because there were many countries at that time who had not been exposed to that type of That's food. Right. So, and he, That's right. is, the book is phenomenal because it's just yeah. massively filled with these pictures that document that. Yeah. So, you know, as far as tooth decay is concerned and health generally, better diet. Mm -hmm. Better diet. And as far as this issue is concerned, when you've got 23 studies which shows a lowering of IQ, and you've got... Uh, a lowering of IQ from being exposed to fluoridated fl water. Flu yeah, but not... Sorry, uh, I, we, we haven't had yet a, a, an IQ study because they're not doing them. Mm -hmm. the, the, the countries which are fluoridated are not doing any health studies, practically no health studies. They are far more concerned about protecting this policy for some reason than protecting health. But when you've got levels of fluoride, natural levels of fluoride, not so much higher than the levels at which we are fluoridating, then it raises the question, which is more important to protect, your children's teeth or your children's brains? Mm -hmm. And we've we got some pretty wonky evidence that fluoride, ingesting fluoride, <laughs> may be reducing tooth decay. I don't think the evidence is very strong scientifically, but you've got two sets of evidence. One set of evidence says, the promoters think that fluoride lowers tooth decay if you swallow the fluoride. And you've got this other set of evidence, which from China and India and so on, which says if you swallow, your children swallowing fluoride may be lowering their intelligence.
I mean, where, where are you going to hedge your bets here? What's right. the sensible well, thing Well, uh, the sensible do? thing is to implement the precautionary right. principle and, 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 ex and err on the side yeah. of caution. If ever a, the precautionary principle uh, should be applied, it must be in the case of, of fluoridation. If you believe in the precautionary principle, uh, and incidentally, I think of San Francisco, which has actually incorporated the precautionary principle into its charter or what have you, and yet they've been fluoridated for years. There's, there's a contradiction here. If you believe in the precautionary principle, then turn off that tap. It's not doing much good. They concede, the promoters concede that it works topically. We have topical treatments available, including fluoridated toothpaste, and we've got plenty of evidence accumulating that fluoride at certain levels definitely causing health effects. And the issue comes down to whether there's an adequate margin of safety. And I would put my scientific training on the line to say there is not an adequate margin of safety to protect the whole population from known health effects. So... Take part, yeah, part, part of the problem is that there's individuals who may drink a few cups of water a day, but there's another individual who may drink a gallon or two gallons and be exposed to the amount of fluoride in that water supply at levels five times or greater so that your margin of safety, which, which you refer to, that's essentially right. disappears that's right. because you're getting, you're getting to toxic levels. Now, and, and that's, we're just talking about the water supply, which is really what we want to focus on because we absolutely are both incredibly convinced that this is a winnable battle. In fact, I'm not, there's no doubt in my mind we're going to win, my mind we're going to win it, but we can only win it with your help, and we'll tell you some specifics, repeat that again. But, but that's only one source of fluoride. And you know, for the, though most everyone watching this, we're educated, we know better, we're not going to be drinking the municipal water supply that's fluoridated. We're going to have reverse osmosis systems. We're going to have bottle, other bottled water sources. We're going to be able to avoid it. But what we're really doing here is we're protecting the people who don't have the resources, the, you know, the, the low-income families who can't afford those that's strategies right. and, yeah, and yeah. really who are suffering most of the, the impact of, of this, this tragic you know, decision you know, that was implemented 50, 60 years ago. You know, back in November of 2006, the ADA actually sent around an e-gram uh, to an alert to its membership saying, uh, as re do not recommend, to but, uh, recommending that parents do not use fluoridated tap water to make up formula. They actually said that. And a few days later, the CDC followed suit. Don't use fluoridated water to make up formula. But what they didn't do is they didn't inform the people, the public. So there's millions of, of parents out there that are using tap water to make up formula, oblivious of the fact that the agencies that promote fluoridation in this country said, don't use it for this purpose. Well, how can you, how can you fluoridate tap water on the other hand and uh, manage to educate all the people to do this, and how can low-income families afford to use bottled water for this purpose? So the whole thing is, is absolutely bizarre. So, uh, you know, just as you said, we need masses of people, and Joe, you could reach them more than I can, right. masses of people to, to get informed upon this issue. But also, in addition to that, we need scientists, and we need doctors to read Mm -hmm. Read the literature. I mean, they can understand. Well, it. well you've, you've compiled mm -hmm. uh, a list of, of professionals, healthcare yeah. professionals and yeah. scientists, uh, who signed on. I'm one of them who signed yeah. on the statement. 2,800. 2,800. So if, you're, if you have the credentials and the scientific training, uh, we encourage you, and we'll put a link on this, on yep. this to uh, address that so that you can sign on and we can increase that to even a higher level. And also, I mean, to make things easier, after 14 years, I've actually written a book on this called The Case Against Fluoride. It will be out in it's September. Two other scientists and my, myself wrote, wrote this book to give you the whole information. And at least, you know, and, and also journalists, you know, I mean, you're rare on this way. Would you call yourself a journalist? Or no, yes, actually. Communicator. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. a physician journalist. Yeah. Absolutely. But we have too many journalists in this country that just take one-liners, one-liners out there and think they've covered the issue. They'll say things like, oh, the Center of Disease Control says that fluoridation is one of the top 10 public health achievements of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And just take it at face value without realizing the Center of Disease Control only has one division looking at this called the Oral Health Division. They're nearly all dentally trained, and their mission is to promote fluoridation. There's no other division. It's at not the to protect your health. No. 
There's no other division at the CDC which is looking at the health. This is not happening. And so we need journalists to get below the surface of this thing. And we, we will do it. There's no question. We're going to, this is not going to be the last time you see us together. We're going to come up with a, with a whole right. process. We're going to break these issues down to the very specific points and give you talking points so that you can communicate intelligently to others and help educate them and increase the awareness and the consciousness. Because we don't need to convince every person in this country. It's absolutely not the case. We have to reach, as Malcolm Gladwell refers to, it's a tipping point. That may be as little as 5% right. of the population. Once they understand that, once they get behind this, the things, the, the, the policies will change. They'll fall like, like dominoes. And you, you know, another issue which we haven't mentioned is thyroid function. Oh, sure. Thyroid. Do doctors used to, in the 30s, 40s, 50s in Europe, doctors used to use fluoride to lower thyroid function of patients with hyper, overactive thyroid glands. And so that's a real concern, especially today we have millions of people with low thyroid oh, Absolutely, And mostly women. This, mostly. for some reason, seems, seems to be particularly sens sensitive to this. And uh, cause I've seen tens of thousands of patients, and, you know, it's a really common problem. And, and just uh, if, you, if you're a woman watching this and think you have some low thyroid conditions, such as low body temperature, lack of energy, dry skin, tendency towards constipation, not sweating very well. If these are symptoms that you have, then you want to get a, a test called a TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone. And if it's above 1.5, then you probably have something that needs to be addressed. And it could be, then it becomes really mandatory to avoid fluoride in the water supply, but also other sources of fluoride. I want to, maybe we can yeah, touch yeah, on that yeah, now yeah, because yeah. it's not just in your water, folks, it's in other areas. Obviously, fluoridated toothpaste, but the other areas would be the drugs you take. I mean, a lot of the antidepressants and, and many of the antibiotics, especially the fluoroquinolones, are there's loaded with fluoride. And as we believe, one, some of them are so toxic. Yeah. I mean, these are really toxic drugs. And then uh, the other source would be pesticides. Pesticides, yes, pesticides. So that's the importance of eating organically. Yeah. Because yeah. you know why they're in pesticides? Because they're, they're toxic. toxic. <laughs> they it's kill a, organisms. Yeah. It's not a mystery. You know, fluoride is a poison. And one of the reasons it's in toothpaste is acting as a pesticide to kill the bacteria. I in didn't the realize. I didn't realize yeah. it was. Yeah, it was it one had, of these. Yeah, I, I yeah. thought it was the primary reason was to improve the things. bone density yeah. in some way, but I didn't realize yeah. that yeah. was a mechanism of action. One is to, to harden the enamel. That's the, the theory is that the fluoride ion replaces the hydroxide ion in the enamel. And the other thing is that at those high levels of a thousand parts per million toothpaste, it will kill some of the bacteria. Interesting. Th there's arguments about whether those bacteria now are sort of developed, and so Re now they're immune to it. They're resistant. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Another so another issue. I, I don't know if you knew this, Joe, but uh, there was a study done in England shows that fluoride accumulates in the human pineal gland, mm. the little gland between the two hemispheres of the brain that makes melatonin. Mm -hmm. Now. No, what I find fascinating here is the way that protecting this policy is more important apparently than protecting our health because even though that study was done in England and was published in 2001, fluoride accumulates in the human pineal gland and in her animal study she showed that it lowered melatonin in animals so that was consistent with this. Not one single fluoridating country has attempted to re reproduce that study. Hmm. Why not? It's not a difficult study to, to analyze the pineal gland of corpses in, in the few Florida. Yeah. Not doing it. Why not? And I find that shocking. I, mean, I find personally as a scientist, the way science is being abused in promoting fluoridation and, you know, with science, if you don't have truth, there is no, it's not science anymore. It's something else. And when you don't have science informing public health policy, that's a huge threat. That's as big a threat to our, our country, I think, yeah. as, uh, as it is a threat to our it, health. It, it's a very serious issue. And I recently interviewed uh, uh, MD, PhD, Beatrice yeah. Gollum, who's out at the yeah. University of California, and really high integrity yeah. physician, and, and really addresses this well in the, in the drug model, because you're right, sci the scientific method works. No, no question. The problem is it becomes bastardized in this country because there's massive conflict of interest, which yeah. distorts the results, and it's just you can't trust them anymore. They become mm. untrustworthy, unreliable, mm. and, and, it, and she, she goes into all the different mechanisms or 
factors and variables that it, how it's penetrated into that whole process from the mm. actual peer review journals themselves to the accepting them and reprints and it's it's a and advisory committees it's just a massive mess so we, we but, have but, to but we, we I want what I want to say is that we are firm believers yeah, in the scientific method because absolutely some, some people but who who counter what we're we're saying is saying that we've abandoned this and, and it, we're, we're, nothing could be further than the truth. It's nonsense. We believe the scientific method works. We just it just has to be free from 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 conflict of interest. We need we need two taps. We need we need to turn off the tap on fluoridation, and we need to turn on the tap of scientific integrity. Let's have scientific integrity back in our universities, back into our research, and back into informing our regulatory agencies. Uh, that's one of my missions. I hope that we can see some progress on that, that too. But we can begin uh, with stopping fluoridation. Yes, and the, and the reason, again, we're together is because we share a similar mission. We are both convinced that we, with your help, and only with your help, yes. are going to be able to eliminate, and I'm talking no fluoride in any miscible water supply in the U.S., Right. And the strategy we're going to take, because it's, it, we need to be strategic about this, is to first address Canada, because 60% of Canada is not fluoridated, 40% is, and if we can get the rest of Canada to become non-fluoridated, we right. believe the U.S. will follow. We're, yeah. also, going to, we're also going to be addressing uh, the, the two committees, Austin, Texas, and San Diego, California. So if you're in any of those areas, we'll have, uh, certainly let us know, and we'll probably have a link that they, well, how would, what would you recommend as a strategy how they could participate if they're in Canada and they want to help or if in, they're in those local communities well, in, I think in if California they go, or Texas? Go to our web page to begin with okay. because we keep posted, people posted on that, fluoridealert.org. And we'll have a link on the page. Y yeah, yeah. And they can contact you and contact me and uh, we'll give them the contact. Yeah, and, if you, and if you're in if any of these other communities that you think that there's, you've got some really strong, credible activists who are scientifically based and grounded and really can can provide a good support, then let us know and we can provide resources to help support you in your effort to eliminate fluoride from your local community. Because it really needs to be a community by community battle. Yeah. We're, you, we're not going to pass a federal law. There's not going to be a, a presidential mandate or even a statewide elimination. It's really community by community. Well, it's, it's politics which is interfering with science in this issue. Mm -hmm. And we, we need, to, it's, it's a matter of political will. And you cannot change political will if you don't get the people. Right. We must begin and we, with the folks. People. We've got the numbers. Yeah. We've got the numbers. The, there's only a small number of people who are confused about this. And the more people that we can educate about the truth, the more we can convince them, the more we're going to win this. So it's really it's about scientific truth. And you, you can challenge anyone who's, who's opposing you to just do the research. Go in and evaluate the data. It's there. This is done by the – this was work commissioned by the United States government. Yeah. Objective third party, and this is the conclusion they reach. We're not making this up. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of references in this in the scientific literature. You know, Scientific American actually had an article, eight page, eight page article on this uh, in January of 2008. If people go back to that Scientific American, and in that article, they interviewed the chairman of this uh, report, Dr. John Dool, and and he said how shocked they were that when they went to the literature, uh, you the know, scientific especially literature. the scientific literature, how little science, real science had been done, that there were so many unresolved questions on health. And he singled out in that interview the thyroid function. It really did concern him, the possibility that fluoride may be interfering with the thyroid gland. Yeah, so there's, a, you, folks, you've got a lot of issues on your plate. And, you know, many of you are going to think, what the heck am I going to take up another cause for? Well, you don't have to. If you're not concerned about losing your fatigue and injuring your thyroid gland or your wife losing it or, you know, your daughters or the intelligence of the whole population because it's being... Or brittle bones. Or brittle bones and developing osteoporosis, then I would forget about it. But if you are interested and you really have a passion to help people, not only yourself, because you can, probably can avoid it, but it's the people who don't have access to these tools, you know, yeah. can't afford reverse osmosis water, or other, and then I would strongly encourage it to, to take a step because you can make a difference. You absolutely can. We've seen it with the swine flu. We've, sweet, sweet, we've seen it now with, with uh, fructose and major industry actually removing some, some huge products like Gatorade and some o other massive products. So we can make a difference, but you have to take action. You know, 
It took us seven and a half years for my wife and I and our friends to get fluoride out of our little village of Canton, New York, where I live. But Joe, when, when we were able to stop that, it was so great to actually take a, a glass and take a, go to the tap and drink the water and cook with our own tap water instead of using bottled water. Well, it was great to go downtown and go to restaurants and drink the water. Well, I, I, I'm not sure which, which is more dangerous because, you know, that doesn't mean the tap water no, is I'm not safe <laughs> because, you know, they, they chlorinate it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and because we want to remove any yeah. infections from the water supply. But, and the chlorine itself isn't that dangerous, but when it interacts with organics, oh, as yeah. you know, it produces yeah, yeah, disinfection yeah, yeah. Byproducts, byproducts like trilomethanes yeah. and acetic acids, and those are but the it, dangerous. So, but those are, you can, you can still filter those. Fluoride, yeah. and, and it's just, a, just a, a side point, but an important one, very dangerous. Difficult to filter from the water supply. Oh, yeah. But the only way you you are not going to remove it for the most part from most types of, of carbon filters. No, no. You have to use a distiller or reverse osmosis this to get one. it out. Yeah. So, you know, then it makes it easier for you to to to, to drink from the tap with yes. a simpler filter. Yeah, that's, yeah. You know, easier to access. That's right. That's right. So I don't I don't want to give up people. <laughs> you know, just go drink your tap water because no, there's no. other issues with it. No. Well, we have pretty good water from where I am. So okay. once the fluoride was out of there, that, w that, was, that was drinkable. Well, it's, it, but, but it is a major victory. There's no question. I don't want to take away from that. And it, it is true that there are other chemicals added to the water, but this is a huge distinction between adding chemicals to the water to make the water uh, safe to drink by mm -hmm. killing bacteria and so on, and adding a, a chemical drug. to the water, a drug to the water, to use the water as a vehicle to delivering a drug when, as we've said already, if you do that, then you can't control the dose. And ask any pharmacist, ask any pharmacist, what's the key thing about drugs? Who do you give it to? Do you have a different, you have a different dose for babies from you do from older people? And you've got a physician supervision. All of this goes out of the window when you put a drug in the water. You can't control the dose. You can't control who gets it. You're going to have it for life. I mean, the whole thing is preposterous. Really, I is. love that word, preposterous. preposterous. It, is. it is. It's preposterous. <laughs> so uh, I think this is pretty, pretty good to, bit of initial information. We're definitely going to have more. This is going to be an ongoing project, and we're not going to stop until the fluoride is out of the United States water supply. I'm absolutely committed to that. I'm convinced, as I said before, that we can do it with your help. So we really need your help, and let's do it. Joe, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship. All right. Well, thanks. We're excited. <laughs> okay.